Welcome to science class. Today we will be learning about the features of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Jupiter and Saturn were known to all ancient cultures. Uranus and Neptune were discovered. It's possible sometimes to see Uranus with the naked eye, and we may have documented examples from astronomers in the past who recorded Uranus's position in the sky, not knowing it wasn't a star. Jupiter was the Greek Zeus. Saturn is his father, named Kronos in Greek. Uranus is the Greek god, the only planet without a Roman name. Uranus is the god of the sky, and Kronos' father, Zeus's grandfather. Neptune is the Roman version of Poseidon, the god of the sea. Each of these planets are much more similar to each other than the terrestrials are to one another. But still, each one has just a few very unique characteristics. Let's get started. Located 778 million kilometers from the sun, 5.2 astronomical units, Jupiter is two and a half times more massive than all other planets combined. It is huge. It's so massive that even though it is more than 10 times the distance from Earth than Mars is at their closest, Jupiter is still distinct through an ordinary telescope, and their brightness in the sky is virtually identical. Jupiter is over 1,400 times the volume of Earth, but only 313 times the mass. This is because it is composed almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, mostly hydrogen. All of the gas giants are mostly hydrogen and helium. This also makes the surface gravity nowhere near as strong as you would think on Jupiter. You'd weigh 2.4 times what you do on Jupiter than on Earth. Remember, gravity pulls you towards the center of the planet, not its surface. Yes, Jupiter has incredible mass, but it's so much less dense than Earth. And yes, I know you can't stand on a gas planet, but we are going to pretend. The core of Jupiter might be made of a ball of rock and metal, perhaps about the size of Earth. We can't know for sure because no technology can peer through Jupiter's immense hydrogen-helium structure, and we can't collect data with probes. The atmospheric pressure of the planet destroys them long before they get very far. But we have sent probes into Jupiter before, and we've learned a little bit from them. Jupiter is capable of producing so much atmospheric pressure that the hydrogen within it exhibits bizarre properties. Deep within Jupiter, the pressures become so great, over 5 million times the pressure of our atmosphere, that the hydrogen molecules are squeezed to liquid. When you increase the pressure on a gas, you increase the temperature. So this compressed hydrogen liquid is even more impressive because it's a hot gas squeezed into a liquid state. This liquid hydrogen also conducts electricity. This giant volume of rotating liquid metallic hydrogen generates an immense magnetic field. The magnetic field of Jupiter is around 20 times the strength of Earth's, but its size is amazing. If we could see it, it would look as large as the full moon, which is more than 1,500 times closer to Earth than Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetic field isn't uniform like Earth's because of the nature of how it is generated. Jupiter experiences auroras, like Earth does, only much more impressive. While flying to one of the moons of Jupiter or taking an orbit around it would be an amazing sight and experience, getting close to Jupiter would kill you. Magnetic field lines wrap around the planet from pole to pole, trap energetic charged particles from the solar wind. On Earth, these are called Van Allen belts. The amount of radiating particles trapped near Jupiter is so great that you'd likely be killed in only a couple minutes. Jupiter has 79 known moons, the vast majority of which are captured asteroids. While some of them are many kilometers across, about half are less than four kilometers across. Jupiter's four largest moons, the Galilean moons, account for 99.7% of the total mass of all of Jupiter's moons. Jupiter's colors come from ammonia, acetylene, and cyanide-like molecules mixed in its atmosphere. When you think of Jupiter, you think of one main thing, the Great Red Spot. The Great Red Spot is a hurricane three times the diameter of Earth. It sits right at the border of the South Equatorial Belt and the Southern Temperate Belt. Jupiter's outer atmosphere rotates in different directions in distinct bands. Using time-lapse footage, you can clearly see how some belts rotate east to west, while others rotate west to east. While the Great Red Spot is the only one you probably knew about, many hurricanes of gigantic proportion constantly pop in and out of existence on Jupiter, and they mainly occur along the edge where one belt goes against the current of the other. On Earth, the wind comes from the unequal heating of Earth's surface. 
This creates low pressure and high pressure areas, and the air migrates towards low pressure areas. Jupiter and the other gas giants are too far away from the sun for their surfaces to be impacted by solar radiation. So how do winds on these planets occur? The source is the difference in heat between the planet itself and outer space. Jupiter is highly compressed gas, and while the temperature in the outer atmosphere is around negative 150 degrees Celsius, deep within the planet, the temperatures are many thousands of degrees Celsius. And this applies to all other Jovian planets too, which have wind. One of the weirdest discoveries, and a recent one, about Jupiter is it has clusters of cyclones at each of its poles. There are nine in the North Pole and six of them in the South Pole. Each cyclone at each pole rotates in the same direction, clockwise in the South, counterclockwise in the North. Why these storms exist in the first place and why they keep spinning, despite the interference from all spinning the same direction, is only just recently starting to be understood. Jupiter is the fastest rotating planet. Its day is only nine hours and 56 Earth minutes long. A year on Jupiter is 12 Earth years, 4,332 days to be exact. But because Jupiter spins so much faster on Earth, there are 10,476 Jovian days in a Jovian year. That term Jovian can refer only to Jupiter, or it can be applied to all gas planets. Jupiter is tilted at only 3.1 degrees. The first spacecraft to encounter Jupiter was Pioneer 10, which reached the planet in December of 1973. Voyager 1, which launched in September of 1977, and reached Jupiter in March of 1979, discovered volcanic activity on one of Jupiter's moons, Io. The first craft to orbit Jupiter was appropriately named Galileo, which reached Jupiter in December of 1995. The Galileo spacecraft dropped a probe into Jupiter's atmosphere to study it, the first one to ever do that. When the craft had nearly run out of energy to keep operating it, NASA decided to kamikaze it into the planet. Juno reached Jupiter in August of 2016 and has collected a wealth of new data and pictures, including most of the ones I've shared in this video. Jupiter is the Roman Hera, Jupiter's wife. One last thing about Jupiter, you may owe your life to it. Jupiter's gravity is so immense that it fundamentally shapes the structure of the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is kept in a sort of rotating triangle thanks to Jupiter. Statistically speaking, dinosaur extinction level asteroid impacts and other minor impacts, like this one seen in Arizona, which would cause massive wide-scale climate change and death, should occur more often than they do on Earth, based on the amount of material that's out in our solar system. Jupiter's gravity prevents many of these objects from flying in our direction. Thanks, Jupiter! Located 1.4 billion kilometers from the Sun, 10 astronomical units, Saturn is 83% the diameter of Jupiter and over 9 times that of Earth. But Saturn is well over 3 times less massive than Jupiter. Saturn is the least dense planet, less than 1 gram per centimeter cubed. It's an amazing sight to behold through a telescope. The first time I ever did this, even though it was kind of just a speck, I was totally overwhelmed by the sight of it. I promise you will not be the same if you get to do this. While Saturn is over 95 times the mass of Earth, your weight would not be much greater on Saturn, again because the planet is so large that you are very far away from its center. Saturn may also have a rocky metallic core, but likely much smaller than that of Jupiter's. Saturn is not a uniform color when you look at it closely, but its beautiful pale yellow is caused by trace amounts of ammonia, phosphine, water vapor, and hydrocarbons in its upper atmosphere. The majority of the planet is, of course, hydrogen and helium. Saturn has a strong magnetic field. Like Jupiter, Saturn's interior also generates liquid metallic hydrogen. Auroras happen on Saturn as well. Saturn has 62 known moons, only 13 of which have a diameter more than 50 kilometers. Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, accounts for well over 90% of the mass of all Saturn's moons. When you think of Saturn, you think of one thing, rings. Saturn has seven ring groups. These rings are just dense bands of orbiting material. They appear almost like solid structures, but they aren't. They're composed of countless fragments of icy material. The ring structure is 250,000 kilometers across. That's two thirds the distance to our moon. Despite the incredible width, the ring structure is on average only about 10 meters thick. To give you an idea of how crazy that ratio is, it's the same as a sheet of ordinary printer paper one and a quarter kilometers across. Because of the narrowness of the ring structure, it's not nearly as massive as you would think. 
If the whole ring structure were compressed into a single body, it would only be about 100 kilometers across. And we have no idea where Saturn's ring structure came from. Maybe Saturn's gravity ripped an icy moon to pieces. Maybe a comet directly hit a tiny moon and they obliterated each other. We just don't know. Because the rings are so narrow, when the planet's tilt lines the rings up with Earth, you can't see them. Saturn has a few other interesting characteristics. One is a giant hexagonal jet stream over its North Pole. Saturn is the second fastest rotating planet. Its day is only 10 hours and 42 Earth minutes. A year on Saturn is 29 Earth years, 10,759 days to be exact. Because Saturn also rotates faster than Earth, there are 24,491 Saturnian solar days in a Saturn year. Saturn is tilted at 26.7 degrees. The first spacecraft to visit Saturn was Pioneer 11, which reached the planet in 1979. In July of 2004, Cassini reached Saturn and continued to collect data until September 15, 2017, when NASA deliberately decommissioned the craft by flying it straight into the planet. Cassini also carried a probe that was specifically designed to land on Titan, meaning Titan is the only other moon we've ever landed something on so far. Located almost 2.9 billion kilometers from the sun, over 19 astronomical units, Uranus is 14 and a half times the mass of Earth. At almost 51,000 kilometers across, it's just under four times the diameter of Earth. And for the record, I'm saying Uranus because that's literally how you pronounce it. Uranus is a lie we all believe, like that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, which it isn't. Sirius is the brightest star. Uranus is mostly hydrogen and helium, of course, but it has one of the prettiest colors of any planet, at least in my opinion. The pale blue comes from methane and hydrogen sulfide. Apparently, the atmospheric pressure is so great within Uranus that these methane molecules break up and their carbon is compressed into diamonds, which then fall to the mantle of the planet as diamond hail. The surface gravity of Uranus is less than that of Earth, 8.69 meters per second squared. And so you would weigh less on a planet with 14 times Earth's mass because you're so far from the center. Uranus's moons are all named after characters from the works of William Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. When you think of Uranus, you think of one thing. It's sideways. It's actually more than sideways. Its tilt is almost 98 degrees. This makes its north pole beneath its south pole with respect to its plane of orbit. Uranus also has retrograde motion because of this. It spins clockwise when viewed from what we call above in our solar system. And we have no idea why it is tilted that way. A day on Uranus is 17 hours and 14 minutes. It takes Uranus 84 Earth years to orbit the sun, 30,688 Earth days to be exact, or 42,718 Uranian solar days in a Uranus year. Uranus also has a ring system. They're not distinct like Saturn's because they're composed of dark particles that don't reflect much light. Jupiter, for that matter, has a tiny faint ring system too. Now, I didn't give you very much information on Uranus because we've only ever flown one craft to Uranus, or Neptune for that matter, and it was just a flyby, no orbiter. Voyager 2 launched August 20th, 1977, 15 days before Voyager 1 for some reason, reached Uranus on January 24th, 1986. Obviously, the technology of these satellites is almost Stone Age compared to what we are capable of today, but in any case, it's our only mission to Uranus, and it's made most of the major discoveries I've shared with you. Something worth mentioning about Uranus is that it was discovered. You can't see Uranus from Earth without a telescope. Several people documented Uranus, but because it is so far away, it's hard to tell that it is moving and not stationary. So these people all thought it was a star. William Herschel, who also discovered infrared radiation, was the first to identify Uranus as something other than a star, but he thought it was a comet for a long time. He identified it on March 13, 1781. Anders Johann Lexel worked out the orbit of Uranus, determining it was nearly circular and therefore most likely not a comet. Comets almost always have wildly elliptical orbits. Herschel got to name the planet, and he called it Georgium Sidious, which translates to George's star, for King George III, who was king at the time of the American Revolution. Now, that is a horrible name. Herschel's justification was that it should be named after the time it was discovered in, the time of King George. 
Luckily, popular opinion won out, and eventually the official name, Uranus, was selected by multiple different scientific groups. Located almost 4.5 billion kilometers from the Sun, almost 30 astronomical units, Neptune is 17 times the mass of Earth. At over 49,000 kilometers across, it's not as wide as Uranus, but it is more dense because it has more mass. Neptune and Uranus have about the same composition, with Neptune likely having a larger, solid, icy, rocky, metallic core. The deep blue of Neptune is a bit of a mystery because it does not have any known trace gases that Uranus doesn't also have. The surface gravity of Neptune is 11.15 meters per second squared. Neptune has over a dozen known moons, the largest of which is Triton. The others are just medium or large sized asteroids. Neptune also has three very thin rings. A day on Neptune is 16 hours and 6 Earth minutes. A Neptunian year is a soul crushing 165 Earth years, 60,182 days, or 89,666 Neptunian days because Neptune spins much faster. Neptune is tilted at a little over 28 degrees. As I mentioned, we've only ever visited Neptune once with Voyager 2. It reached its closest point to Neptune on August 25, 1989, 12 years and 5 days after it was launched, even though it is traveling through space at almost 58,000 kilometers per hour. The solar system is big. We don't know much about Neptune because of this solo flyby. We did observe that Neptune has a great dark spot on its surface, but when the Hubble telescope looked at Neptune much later, the spot was gone, and new ones had popped up in its place. Neptune's upper atmosphere has huge clouds of various different gases, and incredible wind speeds. Winds blow up to 2,000 km per hour, faster than anywhere else in the solar system. Like Uranus, Neptune was discovered, but Neptune's existence was calculated before it was ever seen. If you'll remember from when we covered Kepler's laws, the ratio of an orbiting planet's year and distance from the Sun isn't always perfect. That's because of the gravitational influence of other planets. After Uranus had been observed for a few years, astronomers came to understand that its path around the Sun was not exactly what it should be. Something that they couldn't see was interfering with it. A French mathematician named Yorban Levier, Yorban Levier -Ye, Yorban Levier -Ye, used orbital mechanics to predict where this interfering body should be. He sent a letter to the Berlin Observatory and astronomer Johann Galle spotted Neptune the night he got the letter, September 23rd, 1846. The position was within a degree of where it was predicted to be. John Couch Adams, an English mathematician, had been working on the same problem at the same time, but Le Verrier beat him by two days. One final thing we need to investigate today. Why? Why just visit Uranus and Neptune once? And why in 1977? In 2006, NASA launched New Horizons, which traveled all the way to Pluto. Why not visit Uranus and Neptune again? It has to do with the alignment of the planets. If you look here, you can see that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune follow a sort of parabolic curve. When we launch craft from Earth, they don't fly straight out, perpendicular to Earth's orbit. Earth is whizzing through space at over 100,000 kilometers per hour. So if we launch something off the surface at 50,000 kilometers per hour, it actually moves to the left twice as far as it moves forward, like throwing a ball out the window of a moving car. Look at the alignment of the four outer planets in 1977. It was the perfect window to launch a craft from Earth. The craft was deflected by the planets using a gravitational assist, where you fly close to a planet so its gravity draws you inward. And this accelerates and changes your course without using any energy. The New Horizons spacecraft, launched in 2006, used Jupiter for a gravitational assist. It reached Pluto in 2015, but without that boost from Jupiter, the craft would have taken three more years to reach Pluto. This gravitational assist added 14,000 kilometers per hour to the momentum of New Horizons. That's four kilometers per second of extra speed. So why didn't New Horizons go study Uranus or Neptune? Here's the position of the planets in 2006. The planets are nowhere near in the right place to do a flyby. I fast forwarded to a point where the planets were close to lining up, like they did in 1977, and it won't be until the year 2119. So Uranus and Neptune may forever keep their mysteries. That does it for the planets. Next time, we're going to take a look at some of the most intriguing moons of our solar system. Thanks for watching.